Thank you so much for that, that wonderful introduction, and, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to, uh, to give a talk. So what I would like to do is I would like to talk about design today. And specifically what I want to do is I want to talk about the design of systems that moves us away from designing them in an intuitive sort of manner to a much more quantitative manner. And in order to do that, what we need to do is we need to model the system that we're planning to design. And that's the, th the key concept that I want you to keep in mind. We're basically trying to predict the behavior of something that doesn't yet exist, and that's the challenge here. So to begin the talk, let's consider what the definition of a model is going to be. So we can turn to our, our community of systems engineers and uh, take a look at the definition that was put together by a committee of systems engineers. And I'm gonna read this because I can't possibly memorize this. That um, a model is a means of representing the essential characteristics of the system of interest, the environment in which the system operates, and the interactions with enabling and interfacing systems and operators. So if you were to think of a definition of model, that's, I'm sure that that's exactly what you would come up with. And, uh, and while this is a good and precise definition, it's, it's not really constructive in terms of, of trying to understand examples of models and how we actually use them in order to perform design. So what might be a better way of doing this is to look at kind of an organizational chart of modeling and, and, and think of what examples there might be uh, in the context of this diagram. So this is, this is uh, this, the, you know, at the very top what we have is, is we have like the kingdom of model and then we go down the, the branches of, of, of this tree and end up at the various species of the different models, and we'll, we'll proceed through that in this manner, okay? So first, the first thing, in terms of, of, of looking at different models, if we step one step down, we see that there's a difference between what are called abstract models and physical models. Now, physical models make a lot of sense to us. They could be the ball and stick models that we use in chemistry class in order to understand molecular structure, or they could be subscale models of, of aircraft that go into wind uh, tunnels in order to understand the aerodynamic forces at work on those systems. And so what's, what's interesting about the second example is, is that when we put it in the wind tunnel and we run experiments, we're doing a simulation. We're doing an, basically an analog simulation of the system. And that ties in nicely with, for example, the last talk that we had in this morning where there was a great discussion of, of simulation, and this fits right into it. So what's important here is, is that we've already learned on the third slide that there's a distinction between modeling and simulation. Simulation is what you ultimately use models for, okay? So as we proceed down, we turn to abstract models and try to make some sense of what those are. Well, first of all, there are informal abstract models, and we immediately throw those out. We're, we're modeling snobs. We want to do this in a rigorous way. So we go to formal models, and we think in terms of quantitative models. So I've already used the word quantitative ones. And so those can be data-driven, and we're hearing a lot about this in these days in terms of big data, AI, and so on and so forth. A huge tidal wave of, of research in terms of quantitative uh, 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 modeling in that context. But I'm not going to talk about that, because what I need to do for my design problem is to have physically based and predictive models. D big data works with things that we already know and finds patterns in it. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to extrapolate into the unknown, okay? And so good examples of physically based models are, for example, the, our everyday weather forecast, a triumph of deterministic uh, simulation. And also, a great science uh, detective story, the discovery of Neptune, which was predicted by mathematical modeling, both in terms of the existence of Neptune and its location, and it was found after the prediction of its location. So a terrific story uh, there. So we have quantitative models, and we also have geometric models. Geometric models, we all came here. We probably consulted a map on the way here. Uh, that makes sense in that context. We see that every day. And another thing that we see, perhaps, in terms of everyday today operation are the computer-aided design packages that we use in order to represent uh, a, a structure that we would like to construct, for example, using 3D printing, that we ultimately assemble into our final product. So I chose this sunscreen sculpture in Youngtown, Ohio, because I like it. It's a good-looking sculpture. It's made by 3D printing, and it's also solar-powered, so it has a lot of good things going for it. But it also represents the shift in paradigm in terms of manufacturing. Youngtown, Ohio is, is the center of a national initiative for developing additive manufacturing technologies. And so what they're trying to do 
is replace the traditional manufacturing techniques that, say, my father used as a machinist building diesel engines, replacing them with the next generation of advanced manufacturing. Okay? So if we could do 3D printing at a macro scale, how far can we push it? We're trying to break limits here in this, in this session. Uh, what's the limit of 3D printing? And why are we interested in potentially in this? Well, first of all, before we say why we want to do it, yes, we can do it. We can do it, but what's important here is, is that the machining operations that we had before, the mechanical sort of machining operations, have been replaced with chemical operations. We do chemistry at a molecular scale, and that carries out our machining operations for us. So what we're basically trying to do is to engineer the chemical reactions that take place in order to be able to do our 3D printing at the atomistic scale. Okay? So great, it sounds like a good stunt, a good nature paper or something like that. Why are we actually interested in something like this? Well, we've been doing it for years, and we're getting farther and farther and farther down to the fundamental atomistic level limit of what we can do. But every one of us, almost every one of us, likely has a smartphone that's packed with microelectronics packed with solid state memory that has replaced our old hard drives, packed with uh, 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 screens that we can interact with and so on and so forth, and every single one of those processes is manufactured using these chemical machining techniques at the molecular scale. So elements of solar energy, including PV arrays, including battery storage, including fuel cells, all benefit from this technology. And then finally, in the last 10 years, uh, actually the last five years, we've seen almost the complete elimination of CFLs and incandescent lights with LED lighting. And the heart of LED lighting is the diode, which is deposited with exactly these types of manufacturing techniques. Okay? So what we do in our lab is we're trying to push the limit. We're trying to see how far down we can go. And the limit as it stands is basically one monolayer of atoms. And if we consider the films that we're depositing, those are two-inch wafers. If we were to stretch those wafers out over the entire metro area, what we would find is, is that the degree of control that we can have amounts to 60 microns, which is slightly smaller than a typical human hair. So it's absolutely astounding the degree of control that we have over these systems. So how do we do that? Well, these are the only equations I have today, so don't, 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 don't worry. Um, but, uh, but basically what we do is we have to be able to control the chemistry without seeing the molecules themselves, measure what's going on in the system, or uh, a number of other factors that we just can't have control of. So what we do is, is we basically design the chemical reactions that deposit these films in such a way that we can guarantee that they have like automatic braking systems that prevent overgrowth and uncontrollability in the overall deposition process. So the way we go about doing this is, is we represent our chemical reaction networks in terms of graphs. We use graph theoretic techniques and other techniques, uh, uh, numerical techniques, in order to be able to assess whether or not those chemical reaction networks have the proper features in order to guarantee the performance that we're going after. So I like to call this linear algebra meets chemistry. And you know, as, as, if you think about this, that, that probably would be a perfect title for an undergraduate technical elective that would be like the worst one ever. So you know, it's, it's, I think it's most undergraduates' worst nightmare to combine the two. But regardless, we, we, we do this in our laboratory. And as I said, we look for the topological features of these reaction networks, such as these, these intertwined uh, 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 reaction paths uh, that are indicative of the performance behavior that we're looking for. And if we spot them, we have a guarantee of our atomistic level deposition control. Okay? So we're talking about thin films, and so it's natural to think that thin films would have, in addition to the uh, applications that I talked of, because of the premium on weight for launching things into space, uh, it seems natural that there would be a lot of applications for thin films in terms of spacecraft applications. And so sure enough, one of the things that we do is we deposit protective films onto plastic objects that would otherwise be eroded in low Earth orbit. Now, I have a couple of, of numbers there in terms of kinetic energy, impacts per second, so on and so forth. The details aren't important, but you can do basically simple back-of-the-envelope calculations that would prove that any plastics would be pretty much doomed after a short period of time in low Earth orbit because of the reactivity uh, of the, uh, the, the oxygen species that are found 
uh, in the neighborhood of, for example, the International Space Station. So other things that we do is we're interested in optical components. So we're interested in putting astronomical observatories in space to get outside of the atmosphere so that we can do ultraviolet uh, uh, astronomy, higher energy astronomy. And our thin films are ideally suited for, uh, for, for uh, doing those deposition processes, as well as even higher energy deposition processes, uh, excuse me, higher energy observatories for observing X-ray events in space. And this is where our atomic layer deposition processes really shine, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to deposit thin metal films on these honeycomb materials of nanoscale. Uh, they're actually inspired by the way that a lobster eye works in order to focus. It focuses in a completely different mechanism. And the basic idea is, is that we're trying to create these microstructures in order to replace the current macroscopic scale structures that we see in X-ray observatories. The last example is the one that I'm most excited about, and that is, is we're looking at trying to create coatings that conduct electricity and don't interfere with the optical properties of the thermal radiators of the International Space Station. So those white radiators are thermal radiators. They're not the photovoltaic arrays that, that we associated with generating electricity. And our, our objective is, is to coat these radiators with a thin transparent conducting oxide called indium tin oxide. And this is something that we see. For example, if you look at the front cockpit windows of a, of a jet, you'll see a funny colored pattern, and that's a result of ITO being deposited on those windows uh, for heaters. But more importantly, what, uh, what you'll find is, is that in every one of your cell phones, the, uh, the touch screen is activated by this indium tin oxide coating. So what we're doing is we're depositing them on nanoscaled materials, and we do that by a very sophisticated technique. We went out to IKEA, we bought a tea strainer, we modified it, we put it into our reactor, and we deposited our films in, in that manner. And then, at the end of last year, we were successful at creating a number of films. We launched uh, 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 on the shuttle resupply mission in November that was launched from Wallops Island in Virginia, uh, six of our samples were taken up and will be evaluated over the next year for their resistivity to that, uh, the environmental effects of space. Okay? Then they'll be taken and brought back home. Okay? So for the last part of my talk, speaking of homes, what I'd like to do is shift gears, but not fundamentally in terms of the modeling work. I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about our participation in the solar decathlon. So as many of you know, Maryland has a rich history in participating in the solar decathlon. We've participated three times in the last 10 years. And the solar decathlon is basically a student-run design, construction, and testing over a two-year period of a purely solar-powered home. Number of, of important criteria for testing. So the first thing that you find out when you join the solar decathlon is you find out just how many parts a house is made of. It's unbelievable. And how many things that you actually have to design in terms of engineering design. And I put this up because it's hard to read, but it gives you some magnitude of, of the daunting task that we were faced. So given all of the moving parts of the overall design process, it's not surprising that computer-aided design packages are incredibly important in order for managing the, uh, the, the construction of, and design of the homes, and ultimately the realization of the home itself. So it's nice to see that our initial design actually came out in the, uh, the final end. But more importantly, what we, were, what we had to do is we had to predict the performance of the house before it was built. So it gets to my very first point that I was making. We're trying to design something and model something without actually having it to model. And so we spend uh, about two years worth of time doing exactly the type of work that I described, building physics-based models of the solar irradiance, the, the PV array power, all the mechanical systems, the thermal systems, the water systems, and so on and so forth. We put them together and created this predictive model which predicted the performance of the house according to the current weather. And what this allowed us to do is not only predict the performance of the house, but give quantitative measures of the sustainability metrics of our house. So we were able to quantify electrical energy sustainability, thermal uh, energy sustainability, water sustainability, and reduced carbon sustainability as well. And what we have is, is, is basically we've created a digital twin of our house that we can place anywhere in the world and assess the performance of the house under those conditions. And currently we have four houses, virtual houses operating. This is the predictions for today and these are the predictions of the uh, sustainability measures for our house in four different virtual locations, including right here in College Park, of course. So taking 
our predictive capabilities of our house, we were able to basically, in some sense, game the competition. That's a strong word to use, but basically what we were able to do is we were able to look at the weather reports over the competition period, predict the performance of the house, and manage our renewable resources in an optimal way. And the bottom line here is, is that we were able to survive a snowstorm for the first time in the solar decathlon history, resulting in a huge energy loss over the course of the snow days. But we predicted that ahead of time and were able to recover so that the Department of Energy measured performance. We started off with zero energy. We ended with exactly zero energy. So net zero was really accomplished in our house. So having said that, what we ended up doing, we, 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 we believe that our ability to model the performance of our house and predict its abilities uh, led us to a second place win in the uh, solar decathlon behind the, uh, the Swiss monolith team. Uh, we're, we're not angry with them because they, were just, they, they just could not be beat. Uh, and, um, and so what we're doing right now is we're transitioning our technology to the 2019 Solar Decathlon Africa. Uh, we're in partnership with the Moroccan team. And so bottom line here is, is that I hope that I've given you some insight into the way that we approach the, the development of models that, of things that don't exist, both for the understanding and for the optimal design of those houses. Once again, trying to get away from the empirical, the ad hoc, the intuitive approaches that most design is still carried out with. So with that, uh, thank you, and uh, 